Have you ever wondered why certain faces just look angry, intimidating, or appear to have an RPF? There is a mathematical ratio of facial width to its height, after which point cognitive psychologists have found that we see these faces as appearing aggressive looking or dangerous. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the facial width to height ratio, a concept that we've covered on the channel many times, but for the newer viewers, we're going to be refreshing your knowledge on that and how it connects to things like perceptions of dominance, achievement drive, and other social cues. Is there a connection between testosterone in men and facial width to height ratio, for example? And after we lay out that framework, we're going to tie it all together to see how this ratio affects facial attractiveness. Firstly, how do you actually measure the facial width to height ratio? There are a lot of different ways to measure this ratio, but it is in general a measurement of how wide and compact your mid face appears. Different researchers take the measurement at different points on the face, and accordingly they name those measurements different things as well, like the facial width to height ratio, nasion for example. This actually does matter a lot when we are talking about this ratio, because the measurement and its ties to sexual dimorphism can vary drastically depending on the points that were used to make this measurement. Across all the variations of this ratio, one thing is for certain. The width of the face has to be measured at the widest part of the cheekbones, called the bizygomatic width, and researchers will then divide that width by the height of the mid face, the distance from say the upper lip to a point near the brow bone. The facial width to height ratio measurement that is the most contextually relevant to attractiveness, dominance, and sex differences is called the FWHR brow measurement, and this takes the measurement at the low to mid eyebrow. You can sort of see how this would lead to a more elongated mid-face region, as a higher set eyebrows space out the length of one's mid-face. Likewise, men usually have eyebrows that are closer to their eyes and would have a higher width to height ratio on average. Two faces that we've looked at on this channel, say Johnny Depp and Sean O'Pry, are quite good examples of high facial width to height ratio due to their low brows and wide facial structure. The second topic on this is how does it actually affect our social perceptions? How do we look at faces differently depending on the ratio? Most of the research regarding the facial width to height ratio is done within the realm of social perceptions, so they're done by social psychologists, particularly on stuff like trustworthiness, dominance, aggression. Some studies also try to link the measurement to creativity, and that's something that's not been looked at as much. The resounding idea in facial width to height ratio research has been that it is associated with aggression. However, this isn't necessarily true in the negative sense of the word. In fact, Ward and Al Raji found that the strongest association for facial width to height ratio seems to have is with dominance, especially tying into positive things like success and drive. CEOs in the UK had greater width to height ratios and were rated higher in dominance and success. Louis et al. also found a similar trend between ratio and achievement drive within former US presidents. Research by Stira et al. found that wider face males are less likely to die from contact physical violence. Perhaps something to do with facial width cues into aggressiveness and male dominance. A thesis by Dr. Lefebvre tried to find what biological features in the face tie into these perceptions of dominance and trustworthiness. Why does the face look scarier or friendlier upon first glances? What she found was that achievement striving was also related to the ratio of your face, which gives a more positive outlook rather than simply tying it to aggression, which is seen as negative. The ratio of your face also seems to be connected to dominance traits more so than anything else. Things like drive, ambition, achievement, and winning ability are also quite important, but nothing as important as how dominant your face looks. Now, this doesn't have to point to manipulative or aggressive behavior either. Just because you look scary doesn't mean you are scary. Genial et al. noted a connection between the facial width to height ratio and judgments of aggression. So not necessarily a person showing aggression, but them being perceived as somebody who would show aggression. People may be sensitive to recognizing a high facial width to height ratio to quickly pick out who is aggressive and who is not if they were to see them for the first time. Like say you're in a caveman environment and you've met somebody who looks scary, you would probably avoid them whether or not they actually are scary is not something you stick around to find out. The judgments of trustworthiness can only come in secondary to that. This image shows how having different facial expressions can also change your facial width to height ratio. So smiling does seem to increase your facial width to height by raising the upper lip and lowering the brows. This is interesting because smiling doesn't usually equal dominance or aggression. Then again, maybe it 
does in a sense. A sad face lowers the facial width to height ratio, which can give off the impression of a less dominant face. The last thing that we should really cover is what does the research say about facial width to height ratio being a sexually dimorphic trait? Is this something that's exclusive to men or to women? Is it associated with testosterone? The research on facial width to height ratio tying into testosterone levels in men is very conflicting and contradictory, but most research does seem to note that facial width to height ratio is a sexually dimorphic measurement, meaning that it is greater either for men or for women, and it is different for the two genders. In other words, we can tell a male face from a female face based on their facial width and ratio. Now, Albert et al. did end up showing this in 2021, and the FRWHR brow was much wider in pre- and post-pubertal males. The reason for this, as you may expect, large sex differences in brow height with females having higher placed eyebrows than males, and as far as testosterone in males, Lefebvre et al. do show positive associations between FWHR and testosterone reactions to potential mate exposure in a speed dating environment. What this all means is that women tend to prefer more masculine looking men, and one of the characteristics of a more masculine looking man is a higher facial width to height ratio because this is a sexually dimorphic trait. How does facial width to height ratio play into facial attractiveness? This is probably the thing that you're wondering, and Valentine et al. studied the role of the ratio in regards to dominance and mate choice at speed dating events. I personally like speed dating studies because they are the closest thing that a scientist can get to replicating real world events. Men's facial width to height ratio was seen as more dominant, as expected, and gave the men a better chance of a second date and was more attractive to women in short term relationships but not long term relationships. This goes back to a theory I've covered so many times on the channel and on the podcast in great detail with Simon, our evolutionary psychologist. Women want bad boys in the short term and good guys in the long term. And if facial width to height ratio makes you look more aggressive and intimidating and more like a bad boy, then it's something that would be desirable in the short term dating context. And so while it is clear that your facial width to height ratio does matter in making you look more aggressive in the short term, how does it benefit you in the long term and how does it benefit women? Just by observing the faces of say attractive men and women models, in the west most do have a high facial width to height ratio. Especially the women, they have much higher ratios than the average woman you'd expect to find, say, on the street. This is because Western beauty standards prefer what's known as robust bone structures. This could be things like your wider faces and bedroom eyes, and overall very hard, sharp, angular faces. You would find a totally different trend in Eastern beauty culture where slightly lower facial width to height ratios would be seen as more attractive, and they prefer slimmer faces, less angularity, and more neotenous or juvenile eye areas. However, this doesn't mean that they prefer a long face either. Most attractive East Asians also have a normal to high width to height ratio, it's just that it's not as extreme as what you'd see in the West. This is pretty much common sense, but a mid face or face that is too wide and bloated, or too narrow and elongated, so at either ends of the extreme, is not going to be found as attractive as something that is above average but nothing crazy. This is where lying towards the mathematical average is going to appear generally more attractive. What is too high or too low? Well, it also depends on a lot of other facial features, but around 1.7 to 2.2 is a pretty normal attractive range for the facial width to height ratio, and most attractive western faces will be more in the middle at around 1.9 to 2.1. Through Photoshop, we can alter Adrian Brody's low facial width to height ratio of about 1.6 to be more normal at 1.8, and we can give him a more conventionally attractive mid-face region. The last thing I want to talk about for this topic, gaining facial fat can round out the face, that's obvious, but gaining an overall wider face and higher facial width to height ratio is something that can make you look less aggressive. So check out this video on how facial fat influences your looks where we covered a similar concept, higher facial fat is negative for a number of aesthetic reasons, but it one of the main ones is that people take you less seriously. Aesthetically speaking, they tend to see you as less of a threat. And in life, you do want to seem a bit of a threat. You don't want to have a sense of danger to you. Otherwise, everyone's going to try to take advantage of you. Now, in this sense, adding facial width to height ratio will not increase one's attractiveness, even though a higher facial width to height ratio does seem to make a person more dominant and attractive. Anyone can achieve a higher width to height ratio by gaining a lot of weight. Male model, Jordan Barrett, who already has very wide bone structure, has an outlandishly high facial width to height ratio, 
when he puts on some extra facial fat. Editing his facial width puts his facial width to height ratio in a more harmonious zone. So in this study by Kramer et al from earlier, a relationship between your BMI and width to height ratio was evident. Facial fat added soft tissue which conceals your true ratio by giving you a wider face. The same thing was found in this paper by Albert et al, noticing how further research must control for BMI indicators and focus on the width to height ratio brow measurement to account for eyebrow differences. They also noted how aging tends to elongate the mid face and lead to lower ratios as everything starts to sag. In that sense, facial width to height ratio could also have some ties to youthfulness. Lower ratios or could be seen as older, higher ratios could be seen as younger. That's it for this video. If you'd like to get your face assessed and discover whether your facial width to height ratio makes you appear dominant or soft or unintimidating, or just maybe get an in-depth look into your face and learn how you can improve, then order a facial evaluation over at our website performed by our team of doctors and dentists to help you achieve your next glow up.